Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this talk. I really do appreciate it. It's been great getting to know so many of you over the last couple of days. It's been a terrific conference. Um, uh, thank you, Laura, for the nice introduction. Uh, as, as she mentioned, my name is Catherine Bauskill. I work on Meta's Reliability Engineering Team. The title is a, a dead giveaway. I'm not an engineer. I'm an anthropologist. If that term is new to you, you're certainly not alone. Anthropology is broadly the study of humans, so that encompasses everything from our evolutionary history, archaeology, all the way through to our modern day culture. So the cultures that we grew up in, the cultures that we live in now, and relevant for today's conversation, uh, the, our workplace cultures, right? Um, and my training has in general been on integrating cultural analysis into applied systems analysis. But I generally like to joke and say that my job is telling the really smart people that build these systems pretty obvious things and generally about people. So in today's talk, I'm gonna tell you some of the things that we've learned about people as Meta set out to make reliability a first class value. So I'll tell you a little bit about what that journey has entailed and hopefully leave you with some actionable next steps so that you can ensure that your cultural scorecard is getting as much attention as your technological one. I'd like to start though by just taking us back to 2014 when then Facebook lived by the motto, move fast and break things. And we did break some things in the name of innovation and speed. And some tech debt aside, we wouldn't have wanted to have changed that, right? But we had to make this fundamental transition to move fast with stable infrastructure, right? It's definitely not as catchy, but it had become totally necessary given our growing scale and our foothold around the world. But since then, we've also sort of grappled with how to optimize for the right speed. And what does it mean to have a stable infrastructure really, right? Like how do we know? Reliability issues will always arise. So how do we learn to strike the right balance between speed and stability? And importantly, how do we keep the best parts of our move fast and break things culture? Those vestiges that are still so much in our company's DNA and ensure that our engineers are not bogged down by process and protocol. I like to think of this metaphor of a train that's moving too fast around a bend and can derail. But contrary to intuition, it's also possible for a train that's moving too slowly around a bend to derail. So the moral of that story is if we only optimize for speed, we run the risk of overlooking consequential vulnerabilities that could cause a major outage, right? So if we, at the same time though, if we make every process airtight, we wound up stifling ourselves and hindering innovation. So when we're thinking about these kind of somewhat subjective trade-offs, people and therefore culture are always going to be involved. Whether it's how much we reward reliability, what our underlying risk tolerance is, and how easy or hard it is, and we make it to do that work. And so two years ago, reliability engineering leaders at Meta had this great vision to see our culture as a fundamental aspect, not an afterthought, of this shift towards creating a more reliable infrastructure. And they enlisted me to help out with this, driving this culture change and systematically tracking our progress towards it over time. So just a little bit of Anthro 101 in case this is, uh, this is new to you and you didn't take an anthropology class back in uh, your undergrad years. But anthropologists approach the process of understanding culture change through two lenses. There's an insider and an outsider perspective. And the real underlying question here is like, okay, who's driving this change? Is it top down or is it grassroots? The goal is to get these two perspectives at least in dialogue with one another. When they're diverging, it can at best introduce undue strain on people or at worst lead to some pretty tremendous failures. So when it comes to changing reliability culture, the outsider perspective might assume a reliability standard or dictate how reliability should be balanced against other competing priorities. But the insider perspective tells you how on the ground engineers describe what it means to them to engage in reliability work. What are their perceived trade-offs in engaging in that work and what sort of blocks or helps facilitate them along the way? So it's really about finding the delta, the points of convergence and divergence between these two, two perspectives that really helps to at least start to drive alignment, call out the different interpretations and expectations that are there, and ultimately get you to arrive at a desired state where the two perspectives overlap and are able to work together. 
So I kept these factors in mind as I set out to do one of the most basic and one of the most powerful research methods, interviews. So simply going out and listening to what people have to say about reliability at Meta. Now, obviously, it's impossible to go out and talk to everyone, but there are strategies that you can employ to ensure that you're getting a representative sample that showcases differing viewpoints, not necessarily what you just want to hear or think you want to hear. In this case, that involved a fair amount of networking across the entire company to kind of importantly reach people that are not directly affiliated with reliability engineering, but still have a lot of power to go and break things. Um, and of course, uh, I wanted to include people in the sample who are directly affiliated with reliability engineering and are thinking about these things are steeped in it day in and day out. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that we had representation across different levels of tenure and geographic locations, team areas of focus, ICs, managers, directors, all the way up. And alongside, I read as much as I possibly could about SRE. I watched several of your talks, so thank you for that. And I combed through industry standards on reliability. So in the end, I wound up speaking with over 40 people, often starting with a really simple question of what comes to mind when you think about reliability at Meta? In most cases, that alone ignited a really fruitful discussion on the complexities of defining reliability, the difficulties of doing it, the desire to do more of it, and the reasons that people felt like they were or were not able to adequately engage in reliability work. But there's a good reminder here, and that is that if there's any sort of explicit or implicit hierarchy between the person asking the questions and the respondent, maybe don't expect to get the full picture, right? People are less apt to go and share uh, something that might be difficult to hear to a higher up than, say, a researcher who has no bearing on anyone's career trajectory. Okay, so after conducting the interviews, I worked pretty closely with my team to apply categorical metadata. In research, we actually call these codes, like definitions of reliability and barriers and facilitators, recognition received for doing the work, and even myths and misconceptions that people held about reliability. And we applied these, these codes, this metadata, to the thousand odd pages of interview data. So what you see here is the qualitative data analysis software, MaxQDA. All the qualitative data analysis software programs are out there. They're, they're, um, uh, they're all fairly um, uh, cost effective uh, and, and they all work pretty well. I'm happy to, to give any um, details on any of them. But this is just to give you a sense of what it looks like to apply that metadata on domains of interest to the interview transcripts. It's a way of making sense of the data and organizing it. And doing this systematically allows anybody to go back and trace the researcher's steps, uh, right? So don't just sort of take the researcher's word for it. You can see it right there and to quantify the presence of different themes that came up across the interviews, or things that were maybe particularly salient to one particular group over another. So I wish that I could cover all the really rich insights from those 40 interviews today. Uh, maybe that's a talk for another day. But this quote from a software engineer on a product team covers a lot of what I learned when we started out in 2022. In fact, I think this was the first or the second interview. She said, I love reliability, and I'm frustrated by doing it. It's not as recognized. It's difficult. It requires a lot of work, and the tooling is really bad. This is why I love working with engineers. You always know where you stand. It's pretty great. Um, but what we learned is that people see the impact of reliability as absolutely necessary the greater we scale and the more complex the risk landscape becomes. But they also called out this warning to not totally over pivot on reliability to the point that we are inflexible to innovate. And importantly, too, we learned that it was also absolutely imperative to flesh out how to describe, measure, and then reward the impact of reliability work and how to equip teams with easier to use tools to be able to do that work. All right, so rich data aside, interviews are also pretty labor intensive, uh, and they don't necessarily lend themselves to repli replicable metrics. What you can get, though, are the things that are really salient to the engineers on the ground, and again, sort of getting at those points of divergence. So as a next step, we took those salient findings from the interviews and we incorporated them into a short survey, just a couple of minutes, which lets us fairly quickly get broad insights and track results half over half. And so far, we've collected four waves of survey data. And, and these four waves of data are really helping us track changes over time and identify any correlations between the strategies employed by the reliability engineering team and to figure out where we still need to be doubling down on our efforts. I'll present just a few of the survey findings from one of the waves here. So 
of respondents say that their teams value reliability work, right? It's kind of hard to argue with the overall value of reliability, but here's the rub. Most still agree that we should be doing more of it, and about half noted that it's really hard to find which reliability gaps to address. And from a list of barriers, respondents noted that competing priorities, dependencies and complexity of our underlying system, and difficulty measuring reliability were really top barriers to doing reliability-related work. And then in an open-ended response, at the end of the survey, you can kind of write anything you'd like with regard to what would help facilitate more reliability at, at Meta, uh, was that there's just recognition and an, a stronger incentive structure to do this work and, and, and sort of putting it on par with, say, shipping features. I'm sure that that sounds familiar to many of you out there as well. And so in addition to collecting and tracking interview and survey data, ultimately, you have to respond to what engineers were telling us they needed through the research, right? And we had the data to kind of back up why we would be making these decisions and implementing these new strategies. And then also, once we implement these strategies, use user research, UX, and design to be able to see how well it's working, right? So evaluate and iterate as you go. So we knew far and away the first task at hand was to respond to this matter of incentives to do reliability work and to give engineers the reassurance that reliability would be rewarded. And so in all of our cultures, that generally means through our performance reviews and how we advance in our careers. So our reliability engineering leaders use the qualitative and quantitative data to influence internal policy all the way up, the, up to the top um, on the expectations of developers across their levels to explicitly include reliability. So reliability and performing reliability work is a core expectation of every developer across the company, across every level. Another factor that the research highlighted was the need to create a clear system and process of well-defined SLIs and SLOs for our critical services. So over the past couple of years, we focused on having teams define meaningful SLIs and set SLOs that are reflective of the customer experience and importantly, are manageable and realistic for engineers to achieve. Another recurring theme was needing to know what to actually work on and reasonable targets to achieve. So with so many different facets of reliability, everything from incident management to disaster readiness, it's difficult to know where to begin. That meant that we needed to devote some effort towards guidance on how to both start a zero to one reliability program and augment an existing one. And we've attempted to do this by creating a reliability program maturity model, which gives teams a set of actions across different categories of reliability related actions and across different stages of maturity that they can start to employ to achieve the right level of reliability for their service, their organization. All right, so it's all fine and good to be driving this culture change, but remember the metaphor of trains derailing around a bend because they're moving too slowly. Well, we can't over pivot on reliability. Like we've got to modulate how, how much uh, we're, we're, we're hitting the gas on that, right? And now I can kind of more comfortably say that we're moving faster with a more stable infrastructure. The question becomes, how do we connect the dots between reliability and our bottom line to help guide trade-offs and to do so in a way that won't break our culture? So this year, we're embarking on a process of linking reliability to business outcomes like user engagement, revenue, and costs. And one of the ways that we'll put some guardrails on this is by continuing to measure sentiment around reliability at the company and to understand the barriers and facilitators that our teams face when doing this work. Like what, what makes it a higher investment because of difficulty in terms of performing it. And in this case, it's really about tracing the through lines between the reliability investments we're making lower down in the stack and understanding the impacts on user engagement and ads revenue. This end goal that we have of ensuring that we are making investments that are giving us the best possible returns. And on the human side, it's about setting SLOs that engineers perceive as attainable, right? So when, when is that extra nine just not providing an additional return and it's just causing more strain on our engineering teams? And also in a world where it's really hard to prove the counterfactual, like the absence of an outage, it's about understanding how engineers perceive things like, say, productivity gains by not having to constantly be putting out fires. It's an exciting time, and we are still definitely figuring this out, uh, but I'm glad to see that at least overlaid onto this ROI flow is attention to the cultural value of reliability. 
Another thing in closing I can say is that pretty confidently that this cultural work from our reliability engineering team has helped us make reliability a key priority. But the outage that Meta experienced a couple of weeks ago might still be fresh in your mind. I couldn't log into intern and for a split second I thought like, oh my god, is it another round of surprise layoffs? And then a nanosecond later I came to my senses and reminded myself that I work on a reliability engineering team and how difficult and complex SRE work is, how much I deeply admire all the work that you do and how we're not always going to get it right when it comes to making the right trade-offs. But now I can also say that when we don't get it right, we respond quickly and we don't let a good crisis go to waste. We learn from our mistakes and grow from them. And the other thing too is I've been so impressed by how this group is giving such rich attention to the social and cultural aspects of thinking through systems analysis, right? I mean, I've heard the phrase socio-technical so many times over the last couple of days. It's been such a wonderful and pleasant surprise. So from my perspective, I don't think you necessarily have to hire an anthropologist to figure out the human side of reliability engineering. But you might have to convince your leadership that it's worth the investment to build up a, a, a reliability research program. But as long as you're able to take these cultural insights and use them to drive action, I promise you it will be. And it's also really not that expensive to do this. I, I'm not that expensive, right? Um, and you could, start, you could start by just listening to people and determining what it is that matters to them. Match that against these reliability standards and the competing priorities that have been set throughout your company. Then incorporate those insights that you gathered from those conversations and put them into a lightweight, under five minute survey so that you can get a regular pulse on how people feel about reliability work and what they need to be able to do that work uh, more easily and more effectively and efficiently. Then use that data in conjunction with risk analyses to respond with actions that make the most sense at that particular time. And finally, use culture to help contextualize as you optimize for the right trade-offs. And as you continue to evolve your reliability programs, I, I hope that you'll see culture and, and again, just this basic sense of gaining an understanding of what it is that motivates people, like we have, as a really powerful tool that you can leverage to help make data decision trade-offs. And like I said, in a lot of ways, we're just getting started. And like reliability engineering, the work of being in tune with your internal culture is never complete. Ultimately, please remember that reliability, I'm sorry, that culture is the most versatile tool that we've got. And it just might be the catalyst to help us evolve to an ever evolving set of complex reliability risks. Thanks very much for this opportunity. And please don't hesitate to reach out if I can help you set up your own reliability research programs.